So if you don't know me, uh, I'm the, the ornithologist on the, on the campus. Uh, I teach wildlife biology as well. So it was pretty natural for me to talk about birds. And, and so I'm going to engage you first. I want you to think about the last bird that you saw. Okay? If you're on this campus, that's often the, the, the most common bird that we have on this campus, the Canada goose. Uh, and then we have sparrows and we have lots of other, uh, other things as well, maybe crows. Um, so sure, this makes sense. It's, it's, it's because these are common birds, we're more likely to encounter them uh, frequently um, than a, a bird that's more unfamiliar. Um, so what do you do when you see a bird that's, that's unfamiliar? You, you usually like, whoa, what, what is that? What bird is that? And since I'm on the faculty here and people know I'm an ornithologist, I get an awful lot of questions from, from the people on campus and people that I know off campus. What bird is that? And I love answering, you know, what, what, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll say, well, you know, tell me what the bird looked like and how big was it and what was the habitat like and maybe what its voice was, if it, if it sang. And I can usually, within, you know, a guess or two, uh, narrow it down as far as we know. Um, and in, in fact, I teach a course right now, I'm teaching a course called World Series of Birds and I'm teaching my students to identify 216 species of birds uh, that's, that's uh, here on the East Coast. So the answer to the question, what bird is that, in, in a one way is really important. Uh, but the other way, I'm not, I'm not so sure it is. When, when you are asking me, what bird is that? I've never thought to ask you a question in response. And that, that, that question in response would be, why do you care? What does it matter? When you saw that uh, Canada goose, uh, you knew it was a familiar bird. You knew the name of it. Uh, but anytime you see a bird or any animal or a plant or anything in, in nature, you are trying to catalog it. It's, uh, you, you, give it you give it some thought. Uh, and, and why is that? Uh, why do we care what bird that is? I have a few guesses. Uh, this is the only, the only complicated slide I have. Um, so why we want to know what bird that was, or what plant it was, or what insect? Um, well, personality, or, or personal curiosity and growth. Um, we are uh, listening to what's around us. It's not an audible listen, but it's being aware of what's there and embracing what's and reflecting on what you see and what you hear. Uh, but we also want to know because it has impacted us. The only reason people contact me and say, what bird was that? Is because they care for some reason. It has impacted them. Uh, and so this is um, trying to, to put a name to an experience or interaction that was valuable to you. I mean, if it wasn't valuable to you, you never would ask the question, what bird is that? Oh, it's just a bird, you know. Uh, well, no, no, you all care. So we want to put a name to it um, because we want to remember it. Maybe we're looking forward to seeing it again because it was special and impacted us today, and maybe it'll impact us again in, in some other way. Uh, and so it's, it's making an impact, and it's, it's time for us to listen to what those birds are telling us. And so the next time you would see it is, is this answer number three. Why would we want to know what the name of that bird is? It's, it's because in the moment we are enjoying it. it even if it's just for a, a brief moment, um, it gives us a sense of wonder. Uh, it helps us feel love from God, uh, the Creator. It helps stir within a sense of stewardship. Oh my goodness, look at that bird. It's rare. I've never seen it before. I'll pause a little bit about birds, and, and the, the great irony in my life is that I can identify 200 and some species of birds. And I know their names, and I know what they look like, and what they sound like. But I'm terrible, terrible with human names. Because <laughs> uh, 
because I, I have that block. And the students, of course, on a small campus like this, the reason they come is for me to know their names, to know them personally, um, to be uh, remembering the impact that they're having on me. I, I totally understand why we want to know the name of that, that bird, that rare thing. Uh, because interacting with the students is, is, brings me great joy, brings you all great joy, and we look forward to our, the future interaction that we have with them. So I'm not just talking about birds today. Uh, I'm talking about uh, listening to one another in addition to birds. So when we do see a bird, whether it be familiar or unfamiliar, it's often just, uh, I chose this photo because it's like, mostly out of focus, and that's how we usually see the bird. It's just a, a fleeting moment. Birds are beautiful, they are fragile, uh, they're social, they live in community. They're sort of magical because they can fly and we can't. Birds do have different personalities, just the richness of human beings. Like I was saying, birds have individual personalities too it gives us a sense that they're living in a world that's not ours, that, that, that just for a moment we've been invited into their world, uh, a world that's, that has an ancient stability, uh, that never developed malpractice, falsehood, busyness, all the things that we have. Well, before I go further with this idea that birds are special and birds are immune to, to the, uh, you know, the sins of, that the people have, um, stability, I use the word stability, uh, and, and birds do not live in a stable world um, separate from our own. Um, even apart from the, the things that we do to cause you know, harm to the birds, um, if there's a, a wildfire, a natural wildfire from lightning or uh, a, a flood and the landscape is, is destroyed, what grows back is not always the same as what was there. It sort of depends on what seeds are in the soil and, and the competitiveness of the plants. And, and so birds are used to a lot of disturbance. It's perfectly natural. So I say the word stability. As a biologist, I'm like, no, 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 no. Um, but as someone relating to birds, they, they seem to have this, this thing that I want to grasp onto. Uh, they have this sense of you know, being eternal. They've always been here. They've been here longer than you or me. And then the falsehood part and, uh, and that sort of thing. Well, here's, here's a majestic bald eagle. Did you know that... Ben Franklin, at the founding of our country, did not want the bald eagle to be our national symbol. The reason is the bald eagle has this interesting, if not sinful, uh, habit of stealing food from other birds. It's called kleptoparasitism. Ben Franklin wanted the humble turkey to be the American symbol. And I can see that, you know, I can see that. Uh, and on, on a Benedictine campus, humility, uh, we, we should totally go for the turkey. Birds have a markedly, you know, even if it's not all the, the amazing things that we think about birds and how perfect they are, um, they do have a markedly different experience than we do. And for that reason, they seem ancient and pure until they poop on your car. <laughs> I have a story that's not about birds. Um, one slide here that doesn't have a bird on it. This is my pet iguana. Uh, it, it, he's, he's now deceased. Uh, Ivan lived from 1987 to 2004, uh, mostly during my, my childhood. Uh, and uh, he lived in a cage most of the time. And, and if you've ever had a lizard or an iguana or even a turtle, I mean, these, these reptiles are not cuddly creatures. <laughs> and they just sit there basking from the heat lamp and they just stare. I mean, the, you'll see their eye kind of point up there. They're looking at, you know, a fly on the ceiling or whatever, but they, they just mostly stare. Um, we had a, uh, 
a, a woman that, by, uh, that, that visited our church uh, parish uh, one time, and, and she was giving a, a, a talk at the church. And she was from uh, Nepal, uh, and she was uh, Buddhist. And, and so she met our pet iguana. And she's like, oh, I really love Ivan. He reminds me of the Buddha. Because he's just sitting in silence. And, I mean, we don't know what's going on in his, in his brain. Uh, probably not much. Uh, but, but, but the eye just stares there. Um, the reason I'm talking about eye and the iguana is because that, that eye, the, the reptilian eye, um, there's some structural differences, but on the outside, it looks like a bird eye. And so every time I handle a bird and it looks at me, it's sort of, I think about Buddha. <laughs> Um, what is this bird thinking about me um, as, as I handle it? Uh, I don't know much about the seeking the enlightenment. enlightenment. Um, um, we should all be like the iguana. Um, because one of the great things about the, an iguana that doesn't do much is it listens. <laughs> I don't, again, know what's happening in the head. But um, I'd come home from school as a, as a kid, and I'd say, Ivan, I had a bad day. My friends went and had fun without me. I felt left out. And Ivan would just kind of blink. <laughs> blink. And in that one little blink, I felt love. I don't know, you know, you are loved, would, is, is his response. I was listening to this iguana. It didn't have to say a word. I just knew that it blinked. It understood me. And it loved me or was uh, showing God's love for me. All right, back to the birds. Birds are so different that they live in a completely different world. I think I've said that. Uh, when we uh, venture into a bird's territory, it's like we are visitors in a foreign place. If a bird comes close enough for, to, to, for us to notice them, surely we are being welcomed into their avian realm. This hospitality happens only for a moment. The birds usually fly off within a matter of seconds after we've spotted them. I put this bird purposely out in the, in the sky far away. To me, birds are messengers from heaven, usually in a figurative sense. Like, wow, it's flying like an angel. But sometimes, honestly, like a, in a literal sense, messengers from heaven. They have caused me to say prayers when I see you know, a, a, an amazing bird or have, a, have a, 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 an experience in nature. Um, I'm going to tell you one of those stories now about a prayer and, and a bird. In 1998, I was age 23. Uh, I was a graduate student at Purdue, and I was studying birds. We put radio transmitters on woodpeckers. And um, those transmitters are not supposed to fall off. You're supposed to be able to track them through the woods and collect data on them. Uh, but one of the woodpeckers lost its transmitter, and it was stuck 40 feet in a tree. Well, uh, those things are expensive, um, and uh, I was sort of struggling at that time with my, with my research, and I, I needed every last bit of data, so I needed to get up in that tree and retrieve that radio transmitter. Well, I wasn't dumb. I knew I didn't know how to climb a tree, so I got a forestry graduate student to help me climb uh, that tree. And we used rock climbing gear, rock cli ropes and the ascender things that you, you can kind of go up a, a high, uh, high position uh, to. Um, and, uh, and the tree, uh, we, we I said I wasn't dumb, but we did do a dumb thing. We hooked our ropes to the same tree limb. <laughs> and it seemed to work. We got all the way up, 40 feet, uh, into this tree, from the ground to where that red arrow is. And then the limb broke. <laughs> um, we've all done things that we regret in our life. Uh, and, um, and so we were seriously hurt, yeah. Uh, we both had uh, compression fractures to our vertebra uh, and some other things. So a few months after July 7th, um, I went back to that tree. And, uh, you know, I, 
it was my first time. Uh, and I knelt and prayed at, that, at the base of that tree. You might think that I prayed you know, to, to say thank you to God for saving my life. Um, that I didn't die that day, because I, I could have. Um, but I didn't pray for not dying. Uh, I prayed because the accident and the love that I received from friends after, in my recovery was so great that I was thankful that the accident happened. I was thankful that I received so much love um, and knew that I was loved. And when I finished my prayer, I look up, and out of this tree flies a bird, right over my head. What bird was that? I don't know, and it doesn't matter. It could have been a morning dove. That would have really made the story even better, right? A dove descending from a tree? No, I'm not that important. Maybe God is speaking to you through birds. Maybe God does it in a different way than, uh, for you than for me. But in any case, it's important to listen. Listen to the things that affect you. Listen to the other, other people around you. Um, what can birds tell us? And for me, it's the wonderful message of God's love. Now, I could end my talk here. That would be great, um, looking at my time. But I still have a few minutes. Uh, and so I'm going to shift gears once again and talk a little bit of science. What can birds tell us besides that God loves us? Birds can tell us uh, that, that we're in trouble. And so here we have a canary in the mine. You might have just thought that was an expression, but it's a real thing. Uh, and it, it happened for hundreds of years uh, in, in mines. Um, the reproductive, or not reproductive, the respiratory system of a bird is highly efficient at getting oxygen out of the air. This is because they fly, and flying burns huge amounts of calories. It's, it's very en expensive energetically. So they have to have these systems where um, they're getting lots in, uh, of, of molecules of oxygen out of the air. Well, that means that they're also really effective at, at getting pollutants out of the air, too and absorbing it into their body. And so the, the canary in the mine, if the, the gases in the mine were building up, uh, this bird would be much, much more easily susceptible to that, to that toxicity. And the bird would, uh, would lose consciousness and get sick, and the miner would, would then be like, well, you know, we gotta get out of here. So that's kind of a literal canary in the mine um, uh, example of what birds can tell us. But uh, birds, more broadly, can tell us uh, about our, our own environment, uh, even if we're not in a mine. Um, there are 10,000 species of birds on the planet, and they live everywhere, every continent, every habitat, amongst people and away from people. And um, unfortunately, uh, we're seeing declines in basically all these species of birds. Uh, there was a study that came out in, uh, in 2019, I believe, uh, that documented a, a loss of 2.9 billion birds, that is individual birds, since 1970. So scientists were collecting, have collected data for many decades, and, and they have a sense of how many individuals there are, on, uh, in this case, in North America. They, had, they, can, they can go back and look at the records and figure out what the population sizes were in 1970. And then they compare uh, what the population sizes are today. And it's a difference of 2.9 billion. So populations have, have really uh, decreased. Shorebirds are down 37%. Landbirds down 27%. Waterbirds down 22%. Um, birds that eat insects, flying insects, are down 32%. The only uh, positive number, waterfowl, up 56%. So on the one hand, this is, I mean, this is, the rest of this is bad news. Let me talk, talk to you about this a little bit. It's a sign of hope that we can reverse these trends if we wanted to, uh, because what has happened since 1970 is a lot of protection of wetlands, the habitat where these waterfowl live. We have protected them legally, 
uh, from destruction. Uh, we've improved the wetlands. The, we've cleaned up water pollution. Uh, and so the birds can come back uh, if we listen to them. This is not just something in North America, uh, but uh, I, I will go through the slide here, but um, there's a 20% uh, decrease in overall breeding bird abundance in the European Union since 1980. That's uh, half a billion birds gone. And it's, it's not all across the board, but it's, it's mostly all across the board. Here is a survey from Asia and um, we have percentage loss, well, well, let's see, percentage of population and the trend. So globally, uh, what, how you read this slide is about 55% of all bird species are decreasing. Um, and, uh, and the blue are stable populations, so there's about 30%, uh, 30 of species are, are stable, not decreasing, not increasing. And then the green bars, you know, there are some species that are winners. They're, in, they're increasing a little bit. Um, the line here is what would be expected for these red bars if everything was, if everything was stable. I mean, you can't expect all populations to always be stable. There's going to be some that are increasing, some that are decreasing. But the proportion that are decreasing is far beyond what we would expect by random chance. Uh, there is definitely something going on. If none of those data matter to you, and you're just really interested in what's happening in Westmoreland County, uh, here are data from the Christmas bird count. Um, these are years from 1970 to 2020, uh, and this is the number of birds per um, like count hour. Uh, so there's a lot of volunteers that go out and look for birds on a certain date uh, in December. Um, and here is an American tree sparrow. Lots of it, you know, this is why we need really big data sets, because there's a lot of noise there, but you can see this decreasing trend, can't you? What's this tree sparrow saying? I don't, I don't speak bird, but it's, it's still, I'm listening, and I can, I can hear what it's saying. Um, the black hat chickadee um, Seemed to increase through through the first few years, but it's it's definitely declining. This is this is one little outlier. That's because they had, um, you know, a, a really enthusiastic counter apparently. Uh, Dr. Ian Owens, 2019, director of Cornell Labor Laboratory of Ornithology. It's ecological collapse on an unprecedented scale. That's what he's telling us. Uh, is that what the birds are telling us? Rachel Carson in 1962, she was telling us the same thing. 1962, that was a long time ago, and yet we still have these, this, the potential for a spring without voices, where there's silence laying over the fields and woods in March. It's because of, uh, well, she was worried about pesticides. We're still worried about pesticides impacting the food that the birds eat. So you're encouraged to use native plants in your yard, keep your cats indoors, prevent uh, harm from window strikes, um, and uh, reduce plastic, and drink shade-grown coffee, uh, which uh, is a lot better for the environment than just uh, you know um, tropical forests torn down and then coffee grown up in its place. Throughout my talk, I've talked about, uh, I've, I've said, I mean, Benedictine values, I, I, talked, I, I, I use the word st stability, <laughs> I use the word hospitality, I use the word community, um, I use the word prayer, I use the word stewardship and love. These are Benedictine values. Um, the, the listening to birds and to each other belongs on this campus. And um, I'll end there. Thank you very much.